the way this uh, talk started that I was discussing possibility of with Peter of coming and actually of coming to the Institute somehow didn't work out, but uh, I'm happy that at least virtually I can be in Simone Lecture Hall and uh, I to thank uh, Peter and uh, Alex for uh, making this talk uh, possible. And um, in some way, I mean, this is, so I'm going to present new work that has not been announced before with uh, Amir Mohammadi and Jiren Wang, and in some ways they're sort of very fitting to give it the institute. So because the first time we started were talking in this direction, working in this direction was in fact at the institute during the summer of 2015, if I'm not mistaken, where the three of us happened to be there for a few weeks. And um, it's also related to things uh, that I was discussing with uh, Akshay and uh, Margulis even earlier in this special year that uh, Lubotsky organized, which I don't even remember which year that was. And okay, maybe on a slightly more personal note, and also this is the kind of thing I enjoy talking about with uh, Jean Bourguin, and I was well working on that, and definitely now when speaking at the Institute, I uh, really miss him. So, okay, so I'm going to start at the beginning. Today, the plan is to give a general overview, some background and some introduction. And the plan is that the next talk, which will be in a week by Amir and Jiren would be, um, would be self-contained. It would you not have to be in this talk to understand the next talk. Maybe there would be less uh, motivation and background, but... Um, the next talk will also start from the beginning. So let me begin by uh, telling you about this wonderful theorem of uh, Marina Ratner. Um, so uh, Marina works with Lie groups, but I like better to work with linear algebraic groups. So let G be a linear algebraic group, say uh, over R, gamma lattice. And Suppose I have a one parameter in an important group, which, okay, this is an algebraic group seminar, so I'm pretty sure this is a complete waste of time, but uh, there are at least some graduate students here, so I just say what this means. It means that I, in this context, I mean, we're talking G is a group of matrices, maybe satisfying certain equations, but it's a group of matrices. So a one parameter in an important group, I just take an important matrix and I take the exponential of parameter T times this important matrix. This gives me it sort of looks exponential, but it's polynomial because I'm taking an important matrix and this gives me a polynomial trajectory, a polynomial, a one parameter group with a, a polynomial uh, parameterization. And let me just give right at the outset definition that I think should be standard, and I'm not sure it's really standard yet, but it would be eventually. But if I have some group acting on some space, um, an orbit of the group is periodic if the stabilizer in the acting group of my point is a lattice in the acting group. So, okay, I'll use the word lattice, but just to emphasize, um, I am, um, what this means is sort of nearby the action is locally free, the stabilizer is discrete. And this orbit supports a unique L invariant probability measure, which I would denote by M of LX. In G mod gamma, periodic orbits are always closed, but it's not necessarily compact, a bit uh, confusing. But of course, if I take SLN R modulo SLN Z, it is the whole space is a periodic orbit of SLN R, and obviously not compact. So now I can state this wonderful theorem of Marina Ratner. Um, I take uh, point X in G mod gamma. Uh, I take a uh, function, continuous function, which decays at infinity, or doesn't really matter. Then if I do the ergodic average along the orbit of the important group UT, right? I didn't say it explicitly in this slide, but UT is this one is the one parameter in important group. Take any point, and I do the ergodic average from this one point. This converges to something nice. 
So it's not true that for every point it would converge, or not always true that for every point it would converge to the average of effort the whole space. But um, what is true is that it converges to the average of f over something nice, and the something nice is a periodic orbit of some group containing uh, around my point x. Uh, your work uh, applies to powers of a unipotent element, a z action, right? Um, yeah, I mean, you could, uh, yeah, that sort of. Um, Whatever you're making effective would apply there too, right? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's uh, the passage from this to, from, uh, so basically if you have a quantum distribution theorem and some uh, mixing, then you have also control over, uh, say, uh, this flow at integral times or, uh, or also uh, skipping with some uh, skip. Is in the applications the period, the dependence on the powers uh, in some applications, like in, as you know, type two sums, which we're looking forward to. <laughs> That's kind of relevant. So I'm just. I'm, yeah, I'm right. absolutely. Absolutely. But I mean, the real issue is uh, understanding this uh, limit. Uh, for the flow uh, effectively, and then everything else you could uh, deduce from that. And the key point for those of you who uh, haven't seen this before, not sure how many people are uh, like that, but the key thing is that uh, Ragnar's equity distribution theorem applies to all points. It's not something that is applies for almost every point, which is sort of what, say, you uh, used to if you used to ergodic theory. It applies to all points, and that's what makes it useful for number theory because number theorists don't care that something is true for almost every point or almost every number. They want to know whether uh, square root of two or uh, cubic root of three satisfies this property. They're not uh, almost everywhere says you tells you nothing about particular points. Now, this theorem of Ratner implies in particular the Agunathan conjecture, which was, I think, her motivation. Um, that if I take G and gamma as above and H, uh, some subgroup of degenerated by one parameter in important groups, it's relatively easy to pass from one parameter in important groups to group generated by one parameter in important groups. That's a relatively soft argument. Then for any point X in G mod gamma, if I look at the orbit closure of X under H, this is going to be again something nice, periodic orbit of some group, which obviously would contain H. Uh, so Marina Ratner proved this using her strategy of through the circuit distribution theorem, which itself relied on um, both the measure classification theorem and on some non-divergence estimates by Daniel Morgulis. Um, but um, using a completely different route, uh, Margulis and Daniel Margulis gave some important special cases of Kragunatsan conjecture uh, earlier. Um, in particular, this work uh, enabled Morgulis to prove the long-standing Oppenheim conjecture. Okay, so that's sort of uh, very brief background. There will be uh, some less brief background in a minute. But I think I'm already in a position to state our main theorem. And this is our main theorem. And if you're counting, this is theorem three, but I think uh, I call it main theorem throughout uh, these slides. So let G be either SL2C or uh, SL2R times SL2R, gamma and arithmetic lattice. And okay, inside both of these groups, there's a natural copy of SL2R sitting, which I would call H. Inside SL2C, it's obvious what is the natural copy of SL2R that sits inside. Inside SL2R times SL2R, I'm looking at the diagonally embedded SL2R, right? So it's GG, G in SL2R. And inside this copy of SL2, I have the one parameter group which corresponds to this, uh, to this uh, upper uh, diagonal uh, important group or the diagonal group in SL2. They correspond to some subgroup of H, which of course, then becomes the subgroup of G. 
And now, um, so this is the one parameter for the experts uh, non-orospheric uh, uniform group. It acts on uh, G mod gamma. And the theorem that we prove is that either you have quantitative equidistribution. So to be more precise, what I do, I'm taking uh, either for any test function, I do a fixed amount unit integral over the uh, unipotent, uh, unipotent orbit of this point of unit size, and then expand it by some large diagonal element. So this one becomes a big unipotent orbit around the point A log T of X zero, right? So it's a big unipotent orbit around a different point. And I compare it to the average of F of phi on G mod gamma. So this is uh, less than some uh, polynomial uh, negative degree in T. And uh, the implicit constant and basically there's something which depends only on G and gamma and something which depends on phi on the Sobolev norm of phi on basically the size of phi and its derivatives. First three derivatives, 10 derivatives, whatever. Probably not so many. So that's sort of a quantum equidistribution result. Of course, it doesn't have to happen all the time. Even like I said, in, in Marina's, uh, in Marina right now, the distribution theorem, there's also some exceptional uh, situations. And here, I mean, the exceptional situation is sort of the obvious exceptional situation. It could be that you are on a periodic H orbit. And then of course, uh, both of these uh, A and U are subgroups of H. So you're going to stay in this periodic orbit. Um, so then uh, you're not going to escape this periodic orbit. It could be that you're extremely close to periodic orbit. Then it's also trouble because we're talking about some finitary statement. I'm talking about some fixed, uh, a fixed moment. And maybe I should say, actually, I mean, this, uh, when I say T bigger than T zero, Delta X zero, I mean, uh, everything here is completely effective, explicit, etc. You could make it as effective and explicit as you would like, uh, given enough uh, in, given enough stamina. So uh, the exponent, the exponent, uh, it's a delta or kappa one. Okay, so there's something which is essentially the spectral gap. Yeah, yeah, that's some a mixing thing. What is what does that depend on? The kappa is just a spectral gap. Okay. Um, okay, maybe it's some manipulation, maybe divided by 100 or something, but the cap is just a spectral gap. Oh, and then there's parameter delta. Sorry, this sorry. parameter delta is something you play with. So if delta is small, you get worse rates, but then you are more surprised when it doesn't hold. I mean, you're basically, the distance from X0 to this periodic orbit is a fixed power of T. But how, how big the volume of the periodic orbit is also depends on delta. So that is the parameter you play with. Uh, the bigger delta is, the sharper the exponent, but sort of uh, the more, the easier it is for a point to declare itself close to a periodic H orbit. So uh, in the work, maybe it's green and tau on no manifolds where they have a piece of a, of a null potent orbit equidistributed, but also um, is this sort of matching that? Important orbits are different, especially if you do what you were discussing earlier, going along sometimes, because in important orbits, when you go along some big jumps, it just becomes essentially, okay, it's not quite an orbit, but it's some kind of polynomial. It, it sort of doesn't make a difference going along large jumps. And in a semi-simple group, I mean, this kind of thing that you just go along large jumps is going to be just false. So, um, I mean, the nil potent world, you could say things that are true, which are stronger than what's true yeah. okay. in, the, okay. in the semi-simple case. Yeah. Okay. Oh, you know, can I slow you down a bit? I mean, I don't hear you, Alex. I think I, think I would be a voice for I still don't hear you. What? <laughs> now it's better? Yeah, now it's better. I, I, no, I just want, I, I, I feel I will be a voice for others if you can maybe go over again because 
uh, if I understand correctly, this is not the same kind of, it's not more of the same in the sense of another effective theorem of the same kind that we had in a different consideration. You have here some. Uh, so this is new. This is something which was considered uh, a hard problem, and this is the first instance. Uh, but I would say this clearly. I mean, I'm not going to neglect my duty of saying what's new here. Maybe, maybe uh, Alex, yeah, Alex, if you have a, say, SL2R and a unipotent, then you can use harmonic analysis to prove it. That's how Furstenberg proved it, basically. But if you, uh, in a group which is really big and you have this one parameter thing, then you can't use those methods, which are the usual effective methods. So, I mean, I, I'm actually going to sort of discuss this in some detail. So I think uh, you will have your, uh, your questions answered. Just <laughs> let me tell the story the way I want to tell it and we'll get there. Yeah, well, you got two uh, guys running the seminar who tried to push it in their direction, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, yeah, slowly, I mean, these are this still questions that I plan for. So what I emphasized while I was stating the theorem and I'm emphasizing again, we were not stand, studying a single uh, unipotent trajectory. I start from a point, I go with the flow and go and go and go and go and go and see what happens. I'm taking, it's sort of uh, following Mimish Sha. I'm taking a fixed piece of a U orbit and I expand it by the diagonal group. It sort of seems to be uh, more or less the same. Um, but it's better behaved, this Nimisha version, uh, especially when Jimut Gamma is not compact, but not only that. So the only obstruction, like I said, to equidistribution distribution in this case, in the CO1, is at my point being extremely close to a periodic H orbit. You don't have to worry about the tubes of H orbits and uh, being close to periodic aerosphere, et cetera, et cetera. And let me say, so for uh, SL2R times SL2R, there sort of are two types of lattices, irreducible lattices and reducible lattices. And both are interesting and in both this is completely new. So the reducible case basically, uh, the most interesting cases were gamma one, gamma two, are both the same lattice inside SL2R. And this is some kind of um, joining statement. And Gamma reducible, and this is sort of a bigger space, and you sort of have uh, it's an interesting uh, question. Um, let me state something. So, this is sort of digressing, but uh, okay. Uh, I was tried, Alex and uh, Peter tried to push me to digress in one direction, I put I digress in another direction. Suppose I have some. Uh, I'm looking at the strata of a billion differentials. So I'm looking basically at uh, flat structures on the surface of genus G with some given singularities are sort of, let's say, endpoints. And in each, each point, there's a cone singularity. The angle around this point is not two pi, but two pi times uh, one plus uh, alpha one or one plus alpha two, et cetera. And sort of if you do some kind of uh, gauss bonnet or something, uh, these uh, multiplicities will have to add up to 2g minus 2. And if you have a flat structure, which is basically you get by sort of gluing pieces of paper, you could take SL2R, it knows how to act on pieces of paper, it changes your flat structure. Um, and if you have SL2R, and again, I can take my favorite unipotent and diagonal elements inside this SL2R. And take a point in this uh, modular space of flat st uh, structure. If you want, you could restrict yourself. I mean, this was a natural thing to do. You would restrict yourself to having uh, area one for this flat structure. And now you could take uh, uniform measure on the unit interval and push forward x zero and uh, take sort of the measure which you take by a, a random a unipotent between zero and one applied to this. Uh, point x0, which itself is sort of a flat structure. Um, then what I would conjecture, or we would conjecture that if you apply the, you take this unit piece of a diagonal of a unipotent element and you apply to it an expanding 
a diagonal element, this would converge weak star to an affect probability measure on the space of flat structures in the sense of S king of the Khan. Okay, so this is a conjecture. And let me give some remarks about this conjecture. Um, I can't show the remarks and the conjecture at the same time. So any questions about this conjecture before I get to the remarks? So, um, let me give some remarks. So, Eskim is Zahar in Mohammadi, who is, uh, as you may recall, uh, one of the co-authors of this work. Using the Eskim as a measure classification showed that uh, if you, that this sequence of measures, they don't necessarily converge to a nice measure, but if you say or average them, then you'd get some convergence to a nice measure. Um, so, I mean, you'd sort of think that maybe there's an analog of uh, Ratner's uh, equity distribution theorem. But no, I mean, works of Chaika and Smile and Barak Weiss show that important orbits can behave badly. I mean, they don't have to converge. If you take sort of this uh, average measure on a large important trajectory, it doesn't have to converge to anything uh, that certainly that could converge to something which is not a good. Strange things could happen. Um, but I conjecture that this most stable formulation uh, does hold in the space of uh, flat structures. And I think this is an interesting direction. Okay, let's go back to G mod gamma, G S to C or S to R times S to R. And okay, now I am going to be worried about non-compactness. So one natural way to present my space G mod gamma as a union of compact sets is basically um, so is adding a parameter at a small number and x at is as those points in G mod gamma, which the injectivity radius at G is uh, bigger than eta, which essentially is the same thing as saying that when you conjugate gamma by G, it intersects a small neighborhood of the identity uh, just trivially. So now let me state our second theorem. Uh, let G be S to C or S to R times S to R, gamma and arithmetic lattice. And again, there's this parameter delta that you play with. Can okay, and again. Can I ask a question here? Why, normally in these theorems, one doesn't assume gamma is arithmetic. You will be discussed. Could just be discussed, okay. <laughs> but that's a, yeah, but, but that's sort of I wanted to be arithmetic. We'll discuss why, but not congruence necessarily. But um, so you're not making effective the non-arithmetic case yet. Uh, I am, but that's theorem five and not theorem four. <laughs> so again, you had this snob that you could turn this delta you can sort of want to get a sharper distribution rate, or you could maybe want to get uh, some uh, an equidistribution that would hold for more points. So you have this delta, this knob that you could play with. And then for any point, uh, one of the following holds, so this time three possibilities. Um, one possibility is, Equidistribution, uh, effective equidistribution with polynomial rates, again, depends on my Sobolev norm of phi. Uh, and essentially, those again, maybe there's a different uh, constant, but again, this is essentially the spectral gap, this kappa two, and delta is a snob that you could play with. Second option is that you're close to periodic orbit of H or some conjugate of H because. Um, if you take an H orbit and you uh, translate it by something in the centralizer of my unipotent group, then it's again would contain full orbit. So I need to be, so it's sort of, uh, I, it's not just periodic H orbit that I need to fight. In this case, I need to fight conjugates of H orbits. So there's a conjugate of H, of, uh, H which let's say, you know, sets the lattice with the lattice, the lattice in a lattice and has this, Intersection would have a small core volume. 
so that for every point in this whole big and important trajectory that I'm looking at, um, is close to some uh, translate of this periodic orbital. So basically what happened is all of this big and important orbit, everything is close to a periodic orbit of some group, it's called everything controlled, but there is a gradual shift as you go along. That's sort of, uh, that's uh, not some kind of problem with a proof or something, that's just the truth, that's just what happens. You, can, you sort of start being close to some periodic orbit and you flow along and you gradually shift to being close to different periodic orbits. So that's one option. And the third option that you basically, um, you could state it in many ways. One way is saying that you could take the full unipotent orbits, apply to it as some element of A, which in the opposite direction that I was using earlier, the left direction which contracts it, then I'm going to be, all of it is going to be inside, uh, outside a big, it's going to be very close to the cusp. Or alternatively, it's basically means that my point is again, close to some tube of a, uh, um, periodic uh, horror cycle. That's basically what happens. So here, okay, now basically what I was saying appears again, so I'll go over it quickly. Option A is what we want, effective distribution. Option B is an obvious obstacle. You might be close to periodic H orbit or close to some tube of periodic H orbits because so there's a, here the sort of you could the periodic orbits can be deformed. Um, and option C is uh, only relevant in the non-compact case, say that the whole trajectory is very close to a tube around the periodic trajectory of our spherical group. Now I come back to uh, Peter's question about arithmeticity. So first of all, if I look, talk about irreducible lattices in SL2 out and SL2 out, there's no loss of uh, generality here. I can apply Margulis arithmeticity theorem, uh, some cases Selberg. Um, the lattice is going to be arithmetic. Okay, so, lattice. Uh, the only case he proved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not so um, exactly the unique case he proved. <laughs> But he didn't prove the compact case, I think. No, of course not. No, no, he used the cusp. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, reducible lattices, okay, SL2R has, you know, you have type model space of good of lattices. So uh, reducible lattices certainly don't need to be arithmetic. And also in SL2C, I mean, this is, uh, I see Alan Reed, I mean, uh, right, people here know much more about these things than I do. These correspond to, uh, three-dimensional hyperbolic uh, spaces certainly don't have to be arithmetic, but in SL2C there is something by local rigidity, uh, Garland, Ragunat, and Selberg, while the lattices can be conjugated to have algebraic entries. So basically it means that, okay, maybe not your gamma, you could conjugate that to make a difference. If you conjugate it, it's inside some SL2K, where K is some number field, which um, I think of it not as an abstract number field, but some number field which actually sits inside the complex numbers. Um, our main theorem extends, presumably you could also do something for the equidistribution of one parameter groups, but uh, I mean, I was a bit, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not, uh, but let's stick to the main theorem. Um, extends to lattices with algebraic option entries. Uh, with a somewhat less nice option B. Um, of course, I mean, for reducible lattices in SL2 R times SL2 R, even this algebraic entry is a big uh, condition. But to be honest, I don't know what an effective, I mean, if you want an effective theorem, you need somehow somebody to present to you the space, the lattice in an effective way. And if the lattice, Okay, I mean, maybe you could allow a bigger constants and being inside, maybe you could allow uh, lattices with entries also in a field which contains phi and E. But if you don't somehow give me effectively what the lattice is, and I certainly am not able to prove anything effectively because just I don't know what it would mean. Um, but for uh, lattices with algebraic entries. I have to agree with you, I think, because uh, the seminars had triangle groups, for example, 
So here that triangle group, non-arithmetic compact triangle group, compact quotient in, then everything is uh, expressed, I think, rather explicitly. And in that case, there are no joining. The nice thing about the non-arithmetic case in the product, in the case that you're in the product is you don't have joinings, right? So then your theorem should simplify, I would think, if you proved it. No, no. Um, but triangle groups have algebraic entries, no? Right. So you. Uh, so uh, my theorem applies. So let, let's talk about my theorem in this case. So in the case of products of two upper planes, the same group, self joinings. So then they're. Yeah. they're so then they're, they're, according to Ratner, they're no self joinings. Well, I mean, if I take the same uh, group with its same, uh, if you take the same lattice and it's always a tree that is joining. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> yeah, but I'm saying in that case, does your, you've got all these options. I'm trying to look for the pure case, like in Furstenberg's original. Uh, let, let me give the theorem. So basically, you get a distribution, but the obstacle I have is somewhat less nice. So you really can prove it as long as the entries are algebraic, the arithmeticity is not the issue. Let me explain exactly where arithmeticity is the issue. Okay. So you basically get the same kind of theorem. You get an uh, effective equidistribution unless my point is very close to an exceptional H of it. And what do I know about this exceptional H of it? So what I know is that in the non-arithmetic case, so I take the stabilizer of my point in H, uh, maybe not my point, that's a point. So I take my original point that you gave me and I perturb it slightly. Now I get a point with some big stabilizer in uh, SL2R. And I take this part of the stabilizer which intersects a ball of control size. And this would generate as a risky dense subgroup of H. So if I was arithmetic, I would know that this is a periodic H orbit. If I'm not arithmetic, this is whatever it is, an exceptional H orbit. That's somehow exactly, uh, uh, exactly the issue. Okay, uh, so if the entries are algebraic, can you just go back to the statement of the theorem? Yeah, I mean, this I don't have a full statement. So if the entries are algebraic, either I get this kind of effective equidistribution, exactly uh, what I had earlier, this kind of I mean, sort of uh, this kind of uh, integral uh, compared with the average. I'm doing this first version, that, uh, this new Misha version, but uh, yeah. never mind. It, it's a, a, a polynomial decays, or I am extremely close. I am uh, t to the minus uh, t to the minus one over a close to a uh, orbit, which is not a periodic orbit of SL two R, which okay maybe is maybe is not, but intersects the but sort of the stabilizer of my point is going to be the Ritzky dense and generated by things of controlled size, and as uh, David Fisher and I guess this case also uh, um, the other group. Um, I can tell you, I mean, in the non arithmetic case, you'd have only finitely many um, closed SL2R orbits, but I mean, at least one case, which sort of I understand in all of this, that's sort of the Gromov, Kitsetsky, Sapira case. In that case, there certainly are H orbits which intersect um, the lattice in a Zaritsky uh, dense. Set but are not periodic, and actually, I mean, if you look not literally at what we say, but this technology that we give, and there's a statement like that in this paper, uh, in the previous paper that I have with me. I mean, if you look at the Pitetsky Shapiro Gromov of examples, this technology would also tell you that the number of periodic H orbits is bounded in an effective way, but something which depends on the spectral gap and uh, the volume of the space. Yeah, so I was talking what I did with uh, Amir before this uh, work, so let me tell you. And one of the things I, so I was worried when preparing this talk that I would preparing too little material and I would run out of material before the time goes. Now I see that. Uh, 
this danger is uh, overblown. I have some uh, constructive comments from the audience. But one of my goals in my talk is also to explain what's the difference between this equidistribution theorem that we proved and an earlier theorem that I had with Amir. Also, we were discussing this with Jiren, like I said from the beginning, but um, this earlier theorem only deals with density. So again, I have G, gamma, H, A, T, U, S, just as above. So G is S to R, time S to R, S to C. And then there was again the snob delta that I could tune in and out. Maybe that is again bounded between zero and one. Any starting point, some effective uh, T, which starting from that, that everything works. And then I take the a unit orbit of X zero uh, in the unipotent direction. I expand it by a big diagonal element. I don't have com exact control over how big. It's somewhere between, uh, so the size of this uh, periodic orbit will be something between uh, capital T, not periodic, the size of this expanded orbit will be something between capital T and square root capital T. That's basically what it translates to. Uh, this is going to be T uh, polynomially dense in this in my in the space. So okay, you can't be polynomially dense in a non-compact space. So I need to say polynomially dense in the space where I chop off a polynomial neighborhood of the cusp. Um, unless my original point is very close to a periodic H orbit of small volume. Okay, so that was an earlier work. That that work uh, you could find on the archive. Uh, we plan to post a sort of fairly long announcement of the new work, uh, maybe in a few, maybe today, maybe tomorrow, sometime sooner than the archive. But I mean, this theorem, you could find the whole, the whole thing in the archive. Okay, just to, for us who don't know all the ins and outs, uh, that, this theorem is for any G. No, no, the theorem is, uh, no. So, I mean, this polynomial rate, it's only SL2 out and SL2 out and SL2 six. Basically, Okay, all right, all right. So there's some reason that will become clear when you the proof is explained why are we restricting to these cases. Um, I, I, that's you know those are my favorite groups, so I'm not complaining. <laughs> but uh, this G here, the way it's stated, that G is the same group. This is, and there's some reason that you 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 only have products of two up of black. Yeah. Um, I can tell you what the reason is right at the outset. Yeah. So, okay, again, uh, further down my slides, I'm going to talk about the, the horospheric understanding the distribution of horospheres for general G mod gamma is something that uh, we know. And what is nice about these groups is that I have a one parameter group where I just need one more dimension to get a horosphere. Okay, so if you're horospherical, full horospherical, and you need, you can leak in a little further. One more dimension is the point. Uh, morally, yes. Um, as an actual mathematical statement, unfortunately, the answer is no. Um, but that's because of a different reason. Okay, okay, you've clarified. So the point was that SL2R, the unipotent is horospherical, and this is one dimension. Yeah. So you could do joinings of the system with itself, but not jo triple joinings at this point. Triple joinings is a beautiful problem. That sort of is maybe the next thing on my mind. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I believe uh, I'm an optimistic guy. I believe it is doable, but uh, this was considered something which is beyond uh, the reach of technology until not so long ago, and now it's within the reach of technology. And we, we're just trying to catch up to the three of you guys <laughs> as to what you do and what you know and what you can and how you do it. Yeah, so before that, maybe I'll talk. So there are many effective equidistribution statements in many settings, and it's sort of a bit uh, confusing. And many of them are very beautiful and deep and uh, important. And I think it's maybe not a waste of time to tell you uh, the effective distribution theorems I know, and I am absolutely sure that I would miss some beautiful, important effective equidistribution theorem of somebody, and 
okay, I apologize in advance to this person, but uh, here are, uh, but, but let me sort of tell you some, give you some lay of the land. Like I said, important concept here is horosphericity. Um, for Alex, I wouldn't say horospherical, at least if my group is semi-simple, I would say an important radical of the parabolic. But uh, for me, I would just say that there is some element A and I'm looking at all of the elements in G which are contracted to the identity as N goes to infinity. Okay, so that's uh, the whole spheric group. Uh, of course, if I contract something to the identity, it should have the same eigenvalues as the identity. So this horospheric group is unipotent, but not vice versa. And uh, just to be extremely clear, the groups, one parameter group in SL2C or SL2R, and SL2R that I considered is not horospheric. And to confuse you, the one parameter group in SL2R and SL2R, which is only in one component, is horospheric. Okay. Um, so rigidity of our cycle or our spheric flow, that sort of is older than Radnor's work. That sort of actually is quite old. Dates back to Headland uh, in the 30s. And then uh, he talked about uh, so the analog of the Sargonathan project, so orbit closures in SL2R. Then uh, Fersenberg treated uh, in 72, uh, discussed uh, invariant measures. And then this was extended by Beach and by Danny, both to uh, bigger groups and to maybe first of all, the group was only in the compact case, it was a non compact case. And this predates uh, Ratner's results and Ragonathan's conjecture. And one good way to prove that it predates uh, Ratner's results and Ragonathan's conjecture is that. The only place where Gunatan's uh, conjecture appeared is in this paper of Danny where he proves the rigidity of whole cycle flows. And also quantitatively, this is much easier to understand. And here, uh, I think the first result, quantitative result about our spherical uh, or cyclical flows is due to, to Peter. From 1980, then uh, Burger has a result in 1990, and Kramer Margulis in 1996, and Fumino Forni, and Strombergson, and Akshay has some important work on this. And uh, then Sarnak with Ubis uh, returned to this, which sort of, why well, I was not surprised by uh, some of Sarnak's questions about the uh, size of jumps. And uh, Taylor McAdam has a nice uh, general version, and Asaf Katz has a nice general version. And, there's sort of quite a nice, a lot of nice work about this. And I think the main, I think we could, one could say uh, that this is understood. The quantitative effective distribution of all spherical groups in more or less any setting is understood. Um, even in the spaces of flat structures, this was something that uh, Mariam and I did. Um, before, uh, not effective, but uh, I think there might even be effective versions now. Anyway, so our work is the first quantitative distribution result for non horospherical unipotent flows on portions of semi simple groups. Uh, with any rate, I mean, it's not, I mean, we get essentially the optimal rate, which is polynomial. Okay, so to get to tell uh, number theorists that the polynomial is an optimal rate, you would basically throw something at you because the exponents that we give is certainly not going to be optimal, but from my uh, humble perspective, this is polynomial is optimal. Um, it's not the first quantitative density result, and that's sort of, uh, I think, something which uh, I talked about also at the Institute, and I think this is something that uh, confused Peter earlier. So you could prove quantitative density for uh, Unipotent flows on uh, semi simple quotients, basically loosely following the Danny Margulis argument. Um, and uh, Margulis and I did this for SL3R and 
what we were able to prove is some kind of effective version of the Oppenheim conjecture with density. I mean, this is not density of orbits, but density of uh, in the Oppenheim, but okay, it's basically, let's ignore this point. So basically the rate is something like not polynomial, but one over log to some power. And work in progress with uh, Margulis and uh, Nimisha and uh, Amir. That okay, we announced a long time ago. And so the one piece is already written and appears, but main piece is still to be written. Is that uh, one can also give a general, a new proof of uh, Ragunathan conjecture in gen full generality, or at least full generality for uh, uh, arithmetic groups. Um, but the kind of the bounds you get is nowhere near a polynomial. You get uh, basically log, 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 log uh, type bounds. The number of logs is on a good day than the dimension of G. Okay, so just to clarify, the effective density is effective with uh, only log behavior and the new thing. Well, you posted a few weeks ago effective density in that you had mentioned. That was again just for products of two SO2s or SO2. Yeah, that's sort of it's very similar to what we do, but there's sort of an important, there are some challenges we had to fight. But I mean that also is tuned only to the case of SL2R. The, poly, the only case at the moment, semi-simple quotients that they have polynomial uh, rates of density. In the non uh, or sphere cases when I can prove also uh, effective uh, equity distribution. Yeah, thanks. So for semi simple groups, that's the only thing that I'm aware of. Um, I mean, you could cheat, and I'll show you one very nice. In this kind of thing, cheating is good. So I can show you. I'll show you one very nice cheat in a minute, but uh, basically in the, for semi-simple quotients, that's the only results that we know. Um, so there was a screen tau work uh, on nil manifolds, so a beautiful work, uh, gives an effective distribution statement. So that's very nice, very beautiful applications. Uh, so it implies things about the number of prime solutions of linear equations. And for that to get this application, uh, that's sort of a sequence of papers. One of them is this uh, paper of Neil Manifold, another, the last sort of uh, the last uh, paper in the sequence that sort of nails the deal is the paper with uh, Tammy Ziegler um, of Greenenthal and Ziegler. Then uh, Stormoxon just started um, some kind of nice line of research into a group which is not semi-simple, but you take a semi-direct product of a semi-simple group like SL2R with R2, and of course, obvious lattice. And then you take the one parameter in important in SL2R and you take its orbits. So this is not horospheric in G, but I mean, the projection to SL2R modulo SL2Z is horospheric. And uh, using uh, basically an analytic number theory approach, Thomason was able to prove effective uh, distribution for such things. And then, like I said, there's sort of some nice cheating. So uh, uh, using uh, this, um, some Cho and Lei Yang were able to prove some quantitative distribution results for some specific one parameter in important orbits they cared about in uh, SS3R modulo SS3Z. Uh, yeah. Say a word what they are, roughly. Uh, what kind of unipotent? I'll tell you what the cheat is. I don't know that sort of will explain everything. So you take, you can embed SL2R semi-direct product R2 in SL3R in many ways. So you sort of take a family of such embeddings with volume that is uh, growing slowly. So they would be effectively equidistributed in uh, SL3R modulo SL3Z. And inside them, because you have effective equidistribution, you take an orbit of an important, which is going to be equidistributed fast enough in the slightly growing sequence of uh, closed orbits of SL2 uh, R semi direct product R2 to be equidistributed in the whole space. It's a nice trick, which uh, is quite useful in many cases. 
Akshay also used this trick uh, with uh, um, Ellenberg and uh, Michelle in one of his papers. Then uh, Stromberg sort and Pankaj extended this to semi direct product of SL2R and uh, some bigger unipotent radical. Very recent work. I haven't looked into it, but uh, I should. Is by a former student of, uh, or maybe still a student of uh, Manfred Einzigler, Wu Yang King, who proved the same for maximal hemispheric group in uh, SLNR, which acts not on SLNR module SLNZ, that's sort of easy, but on SLNR semi direct product RN module SLNZ semi direct product here. Um, then there's a work about periodic orbits. So here I'm looking at uh, G mod gamma, G is semi simple, and I'm looking at periodic orbits of some group H, which is semi simple. And uh, Einzigler, Margulis, and Venkatesh proved an effective distribution for such a sequence of periodic orbits of increasing volume, uh, provided the center ladder of this group is finite. Here, gamma has to be a congruence lattice because you need some. And the remarkable things you know about the uh, spectrum of uh, congruence uh, quotients. And there has been a follow up work by Angela Mogulis, Muhammad Ibn Katesh, with an Adelic viewpoint. It only works for H is, is a Q, is a maximal Q subgroup of G. But it allows H to vary. So you take periodic orbits of different groups, and sort of, let's say, if you plug in the real groups, you might have. You don't, maybe they're all compact or something. I mean, sort of, if you don't have any kind of splitting assumptions or anything, um, but you get some kind of quantum distribution result because you have an idyllic point of view. And this has quite a beautiful application to integral quadratic forms. It tells you something about integral quadratic forms quantitatively, which is not known qualitatively earlier. I mentioned uh, Jean earlier, so. Quite relevant is also the work, and I see Shachar here. Quite relevant here is uh, also the work of uh, Bourguin, Foreman, Moses, and myself on the d-dimensional torus, just ordinary torus, RD modulo ZD. And here I take some probability measure on SLDZ with some moment condition, maybe five is supported, maybe not. Uh, but sort of the support generates something which is large. The Ritzky density is certainly big enough, but you could go less than that. And then you have the quantum equity distribution there that we proved for the sort of uh, successive, for the smart process where you successfully apply uh, an element of uh, from this measure mu. Unless, of course, uh, it doesn't hold, unless, of course, you close to periodic orbit, which in this case, means that my point is close to a rational point of small height. There have been extensions by Waken Hand, there's that's quite beautiful extensions. Also those work of Halak, Reck and myself, and those work of Boyer. Um, and I should say that uh, William King, he doesn't use the approach of Stromberg, so he actually uses tools from our work from BFLM to study this uh, semi-direct product. Okay, so this is lay of the land. And now I want to tell you what we were doing. And in my practice sessions, uh, I was at this point earlier, but that's not too bad. So I want to talk about the basic strategy of my proof. So again, G is either SL to C or SL to R to the to R, H is an SL to R inside it. And I can write the Lee, uh, Algebra of G as the Lie algebra of H plus some um, orthogonal component, not, necessar uh, not necessarily. I want an orthogonal complement which is invariant under the uh, adjoint uh, action of H. That's not how to do. Um, in the case of SL2 out of the SL2, I can choose this. Uh, Invariant cross section to be, for instance, the Lie algebra of one of the copies of SL2R. So it's going to be a Lie ideal, but in SL2C, this is not going to be a Lie ideal. That's sort of a minor complications, which for reasons that I will try to explain. And 
I understand the whole spherical groups, and uh, basically, like I hinted in my earlier answer to Peter, we're trying to reduce everything to our spherical group. So I'm going to give a name for this whole spherical group. It's going to be called N. N is our spherical group that contains you. It's two parameter group. In the case of SL2C, it basically looks the same. It's uh, upper diagonal matrices with uh, one the diagonal and a complex number in the upper right diagonal corner. And in the other case, it's just uh, two unimportant matrices. That sort of, uh, this is my group N. And so, like I said, our main theorem is theorem one. The reduction, or not theorem one, theorem three in my uh, numerology. Uh, the reduction to something which is sort of closer is to Ratner's uh, equidistribution theorem, where you have a single orbit that sort of goes through um, essentially non technology of uh, linearization and uh, non divergence. So I want to study, I'm taking a unit orbit in the unipotent group that apply a big diagonal element. I want to study the distribution of this large orbit of unipotent, not around my point X0, but around the point uh, X0 where I apply AT to it. And maybe that's, I don't know if it's a coincidence or that explains why this case is better behaved. This has a random walk interpretation, certainly important for a proof. You take a probability measure on my SL2 to be just a uniform distribution on and taking uh, on uh, an important element in some fixed compact set and some fixed expanding element. Okay, so this is the support of the dimension mu L is one. And if I choose eta correctly, right constant, then when I take uh, Delta measure at some point x zero, and I apply to it t over l times this driving measure nu l. I would get a uniform measure of the set that I was considering above. Now, technical point. So this uh, symbol here means technical point. So, if you're an expert in the area, pay attention. This is an important technical point. Without it, you couldn't prove the theorem. If you're outside the area, this is a good time to take a nap. So in fact, we don't take new L to be what I advertise, but we sort of uh, thicken it a bit. It's still supported inside H, not in the big group G, but I allow some tiny element of the opposite torosphere and I allow some tiny deviations in the diagonal direction. Um, so, this is sort of useful for several reasons. One of the reasons is that in the SL2C case, it's compensated for the fact that my uh, cross section is not a group. It's a manifold in G mod gamma, it's not a group. So, um, Arch, can I I the, the thickening parameter, um, what size should I think of it as being? Uh, excellent question. T to a small negative power. Okay. I take it to be uh, smaller power than anything that sort of appears in the argument, but uh, not so small that it sort of uh, would be what uh, ruins my distribution rate. Okay, so it's a pretty big thickening, so to speak. It's a pretty big small thickening. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so one thing which is compensated, and basically would like to argue, in, uh, okay, I'm getting ahead of myself, but I'm going to sort of look at this uh, random walk measure that I get. I sort of would restrict it to these cross sections, and I would study, so I mean, my driving measure is something which is uh, regular with respect to how measure on H, so and I do this many times, I still would get something which is on a single orbit of the group H, but sort of it's a big orbit of the group H when I sort of chop everything to fit in the fundamental domain or something. Um, I'm going to, in the transverse direction, I'm going to get sort of a discrete measure. So I basically would like to say that in some uh, discretized sense, the dimension, or study in some discretized sense, the dimension of this 
uh, restriction of this uh, random walk measure on the transverse direction. And the problem is that if I take two different, if I take a point and look at uh, it's, uh, this uh, transverse, and I take a point there, now that new point, Z prime would think it has its own idea what its transverse should be because it's not a group. And they don't agree exactly. And this could choose a mess, but I mean, the way I do, I mean, this smearing out basically makes uh, blur things enough so that you can't distinguish, the, I don't know if you see my curve, so you can't distinguish the difference between these two lines. One of them was a cross section the way Z thinks it is, and the other is a cross section the way Z prime thinks it is. Okay, so now, let me uh, give you a cartoon picture of the scheme of proof. It's not, okay, it's not really the scheme of proof, but it's sort of a cartoon picture. Yeah. Uh, in the Bergen Gumbert work, uh, there is at some point a critical you say, and um, assume you're talking about their work in uh, a compact group where they need algebraic entries for the generators. Is that the same use of the algebraic entries that you use? No, no. Okay. No, it's different. Okay. I mean, our use is less essential than those. Sorry, what? Our use is, or oh, actually, maybe, actually, maybe, maybe it is the same. I uh, withdraw my, uh, I withdraw my. Uh, well, Amir seems to be. It is, a, it is the same. The fact that we use the algebraic entries is the same. Okay. I reverse my answer. Okay, thanks. Then I'm happy. Um, so the proof in Gambold has three parts, and in some ways we also, I mean, we also have three parts, and some ways they are analogous to uh, Gambold, but the analog is far from perfect. I mean, it's, uh, maybe one of the reasons why we could only do a few cases. But um, so I want to study a. a N iterations of this uh, random walk driving measure of a given point, and I'm dividing it somewhat arbitrarily into three different phases. In each phase, I'm going to do something completely different. But I mean, it's sort of the same uh, driving measure doing the same thing, but just treated differently. And the first stage, which is quite close to what, uh, it is quite close to what Bougain Gamble does the first case, I mean, case phase, and it's sort of uses algebraic entries and the same way is sort of getting some initial randomness. That sort of, I don't look at the measure delta to point x zero. I look at this uh, measure when I, which has sort of bigger beef that I apply uh, the driving random walk measure n one times to this initial point. And basically, unless I was very close to a periodic H orbit, which is a complication that uh, Bourguin Gamble never had, but does exist in. Uh, 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 Bourguin, Thurman, and Linden in this work of uh, BFLM, um, you would get uh, some kind of uh, randomness. So, the, like I said, I'm studying the conditional measures of this random walk measure along these cross sections, and they would have exponentially many atoms, which are separated by something which you could control by an exponent. Um, but of course, these exponents don't match. So, in some kind of uh, discretized version, this uh, restriction has dimension has dimension one over a million. And then I want to improve randomness. Now I do something. Where, where does the separation um, come from? Um, if you don't have separations, then you have some kind of closing lemma, and you construct a periodic orbit that is nearby. Sort of a, a similar argument also appears in my work with uh, Margulis. Uh, you do it a bit differently, I think, with spectral gap, but basically uh, one could use a similar argument in your work. But uh, if you don't have, uh, and I'm not being completely honest here, so maybe, I mean, you have a few points which are very close, but. If you have many points which are very close, and this is somehow going to produce for me a periodic orbit nearby. Okay. 
then there's an improving randomness version. So also Google and Gambit have improving randomness uh, or bootstrap phase, but we, here it's a different thing. I don't increase the number of points. The number of points stay the same in some version. I mean, I mean, right? I mean, sort of what the number of points even mean in this uh, setting where I have some kind of, uh, but morally, number of points doesn't change. What I do, I take this uh, measure that I have some uh, initial randomness on, and I apply some random element H according to the random walk measure. So now, I get uh, many sampling of my measure with some initial randomness after I hit it by a big element in SL2R. And basically what I would like to say is that, uh, okay, in some sense, at least for some points, many points, few points, I mean, in some sense, there will be points for which if I take, uh, the conditional measure for this and for many H's, if I take this uh, conditional measure of H hitting this initial randomness piece uh, on one of these cross sections, it would have a discretized measure, which is very close to one. One minus alpha, well, alpha is small. And right, this one is basically the dimension that I want to add to my uh, host field. All right, you mean dimension? Hmm? But what is discretized measure? Discretized dimension. And should I think of this step as being analogous to, uh, you know, watching trajectories of nearby points diverge under unipotence? Like you're um, choosing, choosing no, uh, it's more. Uh, um, it's more if you want, uh, like the one can't type. Single and Margulis, Eskin Margulis getting further away. But, and that is in some weak sense an analog of uh, this. But, uh, okay. One advantage of having a Zoom talk and not a real talk, it's easier to make corrections. <laughs> but uh, so I need one, basically, I want one dimension because this is, I somehow want to find somewhere. Uh, one dimension to add to my acting group to get a full horse view. That's sort of this one where it appears. But this is not on the horse view. This is inside this cross section, which is three dimensions. So an optimal result here is three. And again, gamble machinery brings you all the way to three. I only need to get to one, and I only know how to get to one. Maybe, maybe one could push it to one plus epsilon, but that's uh, not an optimal. So you don't uh, improve the randomness until uh, arbitrarily well, they only get to some certain threshold. And like I said, it's not like a Borgen Gambo that you get more points, no. I get to say, still have the same number of points, I just get them to behave better. And like Jean would say more later about that. And then, you have the end game. The end game basically says that if you have a measure on G mod gamma, which is supported, let's say, of a ball of some small size, T to some small negative power. Again, the small negative power is sort of going to be related to how, to how ambitious you are about your equidistribution. And suppose that this measure somehow has discretized trans, the so it's somehow regular along H and has some kind of this could has transverse dimension, at least one minus alpha. Alpha sufficiently close to zero uh, in a way which depends on the spectral gap of G mod gamma. Then when you hit this measure mu, which in practice what this measure mu would be, it would be uh, this measure, this measure got the initial randomness phase applied a big element H and then I chopped it into small balls, or okay, even worse than that, but let's say chopped it into small balls. Then uh, when I apply the run walk again, or in two, this is again, uh, when you hit it by big elements according to this random walk, I'm going to get something which is uh, polynomially close to uniform measure. 
where this number of steps that they take needs to be carefully calibrated. Can't be, it needs to be like uh, Goldilocks, needs to be not too big, not too small. There is a bit of uh, wiggle room, but not much. It's something, some constant log theta, where the constant depends on uh, this parameter theta and L and various other parameters that sort of are floating around. So that's what the NGIM does. I think sometimes you can get an idea about something that you're cooking by the ingredients that are involved. Um, and uh, so one ingredient in the end game is effective equity distribution of whole spheres, and also an argument by Akshay, which basically allows us to say that if I have some kind of distribution of a whole sphere, which is invariant in the U direction, in the direction of my unipotent flow, and sort of has big dimension transversally, then this is already going to be equidistributed in a quantitative way. Okay, that's sort of a, basically uh, an argument of Akshay, which uh, close to Van der Korp or trick or something. And okay, I was somehow mentioning the numbers three and one. I mean, I basically, I get dimension of something three dimensional and the one dimension of something one dimensional. There's a projection theorem involved. And okay, projection theorem that's sort of uh, I told uh, Peter that one reason we're restricted to these cases is that we uh, only want we that in these cases we only need to add one more dimension from our uh, acting group to get a horosphere, but there's another reason. And that's, that's this, this projection theorem is a uh, quite recent technology. It's uh, uh, serious stuff and uh, other people understand it better, but uh, we understand the projection theorem only in this case. If we had some more general projection theorem, which likely is true and possibly is already known by some experts, one could probably deal with other cases. Um, so those sort of the standard master, master and projection theorem, uh, usually it's uh, stated for uh, measures uh, for projection from R2 to R, but I can state it for projection from R3 to R. It basically says that if I take uh, a Borel set and I take almost every dimension, direction, sorry, and I project my Borel set to this one dimensional direction, the dimension of the projection is basically going to be um, the maximum it can conceivably be either the one or the dimension of my original set. There's sort of a uh, something in, in the field, this is known as transversality, which allows, them, allows to do this, this is a transversal family of projections. Now, Really, what sort of uh, opened our eyes is uh, discovered a theorem by Kaimaki, Open, and, and uh, Vanieri, which goes beyond transversality. So, is it what they saw you project not only every direct, almost every direction in the sphere, but just almost every direction in this uh, circle. And it's important that the circle is not a big circle, because if you are a big circle, then whatever you do, you would project something in the in the axis perpendicular to this big circle to uh, a point. But if you have this circle, which is not a big circle, then what they were able to show is that for almost every direction, the projection has uh, again maximum dimension that you could imagine. So that's sort of a strong statement. The engine behind this, and the truth is that. For what we needed, we needed to put everything apart and go to the engine. The engine is sort of beautiful incidence theorems of, of Wolf also somehow uh, were, uh, we were studying also related papers by Schlag about circles. It's essentially the family of circles can't have too many tangencies. And I mean, this family of projection is a very nice family of projection, but that's not the family of projection that we needed. We needed uh, basically a projection along parabolas, but fortunately that seems to be um, 
not so difficult with this a very nice paper by Zal, which takes care of it. So we're using all of these works of these uh, six authors. And okay, there's one thing that I sort of uh, not sure whether it's my interest to say, right? So everything you say can uh, be used against you. Um, well, from, uh, applications, sometimes the most juicy applications come from uh, periodic groups, from uh, actions of periodic groups, like uh, Vatsal, for instance. That would have been a really juicy application. Um, we don't know how to do it at the moment, what we do in the periodic case, exactly at this point that this. Uh, Projections. This work of Wolf basically uses in its itself. It uses Scharrier and friends' uh, arguments about how manifolds cut R three, and that's uh, not something that uh, generalizes to periodics. I mean, I'm sure there would be an alternative argument that goes around this difficulty, but it's not uh, an issue of understanding the arguments of Wolf and uh, making them periodic. Just they are intrinsically. Uh, not the way Wolf proves his results, it's and the way Keimer, Key, or Poden, Veniel proves the results based on Wolf, that sort of intrinsically uh, using cutting three dimensional space. So I'm probably uh, out of time. Um, if you want, I can say two more words about why this projection theorem is much harder than. The classical uh, projection theorem, and if not, I could end here. That's sort of up to the organizers. Lex and Peter, what do you want me to do? Say shortly, but I think that's a crucial. Okay, I mean, the key difference is sort of easy to understand. It basically, so if you want to control dimension, you basically want to say that in the projection, things which were things are well spaced. In a low dimensional set, everything is very close to each other. So what you need to find is things which were far away in the original set and then close in the projection. And in Maslow's case, if you look at the range of uh, parameters, that's the set of directions in the sphere where sort of you have two um, vectors, which are say one apart, and suddenly the projection becomes very close. Um, so the, um, this is all linear, so I could have taken one, one vector. I mean, this is basically proportional to epsilon. That sort of a transversality condition. Um, it's basically some slice of size epsilon in the sphere. No, no, this, this one's already been uh, The old one is like. Hmm? Uh, no, no, it's from outside. Keep going. Um, in this case, uh, one of these uh, six people, let's say, um, if you happen to have a vector in R3, which, or two vectors with whose difference is perpendicular, both to some direction of the circle and to uh, the tangent of the circle, then suddenly um, there's a much bigger set of parameters for which they project this vector to a tiny vector. It's something like square root of epsilon. And if you actually take uh, Mastran's argument, I mean, it sort of can deal with that, but it doesn't give an optimal result. It just gives you that the dimension of the projection is at least minimum between, okay, one and the dimension of my original set divided by two. That's not good enough for us. I have one, dim one dimension and I want to get one dimension, not less extra dimension for the horse. I mean, I don't know what to do with, uh, um, uh, something which is sort of uh, unipotent in sort of in rather unipotent in one direction and sort of half dimension. That's not good enough. I need very close to full dimension. So that's uh, why we needed this fancy projection theorem. So I think that's a good place to stop. Thank you also for giving. Uh, the opportunity for a little nap, but it was too short. The nap you offered during the talk. Uh, any other questions? 
So, um, yeah, I just want to clarify for us. So uh, next week, Jiren and uh, Amir will explain uh, more detail, I guess. Uh, yeah, so I even, even anticipated this question. <laughs> so uh, next week's talk is basically going to be self-contained. It's not going to contain the background. It would be contained the statement of uh, the main theorem and then uh, discuss in uh, so the ideas in the proof. I didn't say much about the proof, just some very cartoonish sketch. Uh, this sketch was so cartoonish that you can't distinguish between what Amir and I did and what uh, the service sort of then put some extra few years of effort to get equidistribution. Uh, so this extra few years of work disappears in this cartoon. So uh, Amir and Jiren would give a self-contained talk next time, but without the background and uh, etc. I'm sorry, just, I'm just trying to understand, I still want to understand where in this argument is the kind of uh, properties of divergence of nearby points. Is that now in the end game, effectively? I, I know you set it up differently. I'm just trying to recognize that there's a part that corresponds to that. It uh, doesn't exist in some sense, which okay. is maybe good, which is one of the reasons why I think that uh, theorem like our main theorem would hold in a Teichmuller setting where uh, divergent things just don't work also. It's okay. uh, a random walk argument that somehow the points would like to, the kind of argument that we do in this improving stage is we do this random walk and points would uh, nearby points on this uh, cross section would try to go further away from each other. And um, so it's actually more complicated than what I'm saying. That's sort of maybe one of the difficulties. If you really want a result which is good enough for us, you need to use uh, Wolf uh, type technology also in this improvement stage, not just in the end game. Can I ask a question about um, the non-arithmetic case and whether this um, this sort of having an orbit track, uh, you know, an, a, a, a non-closed but Zariski dense plane is is that real or just something you can't rule out? Neither. It's. Uh, I think in that stage one would need to add a additional. Uh, um, an additional argument, and it might sort of also the rate of equity distribution that you'd get might also depend on, uh, um, for instance, if so, it's certainly false if you're close to a periodic orbit. So if you're close to something which is the Ritzky dense of very, very high dimension, how would I see the difference? So it's, uh, I think it's sort of, a real obstacle, one could say more in this direction. I was mostly, we were mostly interested in the arithmetic case. But uh, it's not, uh, I mean, I think well, it's an interesting direction to try to get a better understanding. It would require some extra piece of work. This paper is already 100 pages or something, at least the previous one. I think that sort of was enough for us at the moment. My Thanks. emphasis on the non-arithmetic wasn't so much the interest there, but more to understand what goes into the proof. But you've explained, you explained where, where it comes in. Yeah, yeah. you were mostly interested in the arithmetic case, so. Yeah, yeah of course, but uh, sometimes understanding what you can't do because you non-arithmetic explains why the arithmetic, what the features of it, as you've done. Yeah, all right, Alex, maybe you can end the, we, we've gone over time, so people are getting hungry here. Yeah. Bon appetit. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, and uh, we are looking forward to next week. Uh, next week. Thank you all.
Thank you.